as class one education. Even then, if we see whatever the if we see the incidence of using this IBOS in the world, how many percentage of um, patient uh, persons are using uh, intravascular ultrasound or imaging for hypertension issues? Approximately 40 percent. So why do we tell that it is mandatory? It is not mandatory. It is essential. But without it, we can also do as a Depends also on uh, expert. If the person is expert enough, he may not require. But with this in augmentation, the guideline has also not yes. decided it as classified. Thank you, sir. So it is essential, but not mandatory. So I think what we are saying is that it is important that we have the experience. The provision that what we do for patients is that the coronary syndrome or stable coronary. But no, we are not saying it is mandatory. We, we all are saying that it's important. It is essential. But there is no, I don't think that there is any problem in centralizing the process. We will get some more experience in some centers than everybody doing it in the beginning. Yeah, thank you, sir. Sure. 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 Uh, Just to have a point. Hello, all the trials which has compared CAPG with bifurcation stenting in by PCI are non-inferiority trials. Yes. Just keep this in mind. No trial has ever opined that, that the bifurcation PCI is superior to CAPG. Okay, thank you, sir. I shall in the whole time. We are, I don't know, Ashok. Uh, hello, Ashok. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you for nice deliberation. Okay. Our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Shankar Karla. And we will be talking about why I want to add what uh, Shansho said. I agree with you, surgeons do the same way, right? But it's, it's also disadvantage over us because they never change their, their technique. They, they stop improving. You know? They can't improve themselves because they do for years, 40 years, they do the same way. There is no room to improve, but we have better stats, we have imaging, we have. You know, we can do ourselves, we have better techniques, so I think this is our advantage to... So there is a great improvement in the PCI regarding technology, staying, uh, I was the making adapt, but regarding scavenging there is little improvement regarding their techniques, so PCI is getting better. So next speaker, uh, Dr. Shankar Karna, uh, all is tested, not wasted in lateral application PCI. Thanks very much. So yeah, this is generating good discussion, as you can see, is just the whole point, right? Um, I think the, the point of PCI improving is, that's the crux of the message, right? Is that we improve the more that we do, the more that we use the use of the I think the comment was made that you guys are really not yet mandatory by any guideline. That's because the definitive study of the clear outcomes of all that was taught us last year is really bad. Right? I think we just need to accept that. There's no sense in continuing to trudge up the same message, which is it's you know not mandatory but essential, these kinds of things. The bottom line is there's there's nothing that's mandatory, right? If your patient needs revask and they need flow down their artery, you do what you have to do. But with the goal of getting the very best result that you can every time. So with that, I'm going to move to this discussion of one or two stent strategies for left main bifurcation lesions. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get this microphone set up because it's a little low. Um, uh, so let's start with this. Okay, so here are here is a left main angiogram. How are you going to address this left main? Just think about that in your head. This is a 67 year old lady who was turned down for surgery with heavy comorbidity burden. Okay, there's a left main uh, lesion at the very distal left main that's near a trifurcation. But as you can see, the lesion is relatively short. And the side branch is relatively free of obstructive disease. How would you treat this left main in comparison? So this is now a heavily calcified distal left main, Medina 111, involving the ostium of the circumflex and of the LID. Are these the same? One patient's a non-STEMI, the other one's stable coronary disease. One patient's got flash pulmonary edema, the other one's feeling just fine. 
So why is the left main bifurcation a different animal? Right? This is not the same as your LED D1 bifurcations, right? This is a particularly acute bifurcation angle in some patients, and angiography does a very poor job of defining the actual angle that we're looking at, because we are limited sometimes in our ability to visualize the proximal vasculature. Neither vessel is truly a side branch. You lose a diagonal, it's a bad day, but nobody dies of diagonal disease, right? You lose a big dominant cirque, you're gonna have an arrest on your table, right? So you can't afford to lose either of these branches. Neither is really a side branch. The caliber is particularly large, and because of the narrow angle, there's a lot of overlap, which makes an angiography a suboptimal tool to really define what we're looking at. Whereas in other bifurcations, you can lay them out fairly straight. And then large bifurcations, those with stent sizes over 4.0, are underrepresented in studies that have been done prior, right? Like more like a DVC. So we recognize then that these types of lesions are not the same lesions that we're used to treating in non-left main bifurcations. So we've got to think about them a little bit differently. And that's illustrated by these three pictures where the picture on the very left that looks like there's a critical left main lesion actually had a very reasonable minimal stent here, or a minimal luminary versus the other two, which are not obviously diseased. There's a mild disease, there's moderate disease in the distal left main. In the middle picture, you can see that it's severe disease in the top picture, but it's short. Those were the lesions that needed to be treated. So how do we define simple left main versus complex left main, right? What is the, how is, how is the best way to conceptualize the difference between what's likely gonna need a one stent versus a two stent, what's likely gonna be a complex versus a simple procedure? And this is where the old definition study comes in, right? This was the study that looked at an unselected number of patients with bifurcation lesions, particularly at the left main, where they looked at a derivation cohort and then a validation cohort with Medina 111 or 011 bifurcation lesions, and then tried to look at what characteristics made predictive value as to what, would the, what the outcomes were, with those characteristics predicting poor outcomes being markers of more complex bifurcations. And so after all of these things were sussed out, after independent factors were isolated at one year using linear regression, what they found was that a set of factors predicted complex versus less complex bifurcations, right? There were two major factors and six minor factors. So of the two major factors, one was a distal left main bifurcation with a side branch disease over 70% or over 10 millimeters. And that length of disease segment is gonna become recurrently important as we talk about this. There was a variety of minor ones as well. I won't go through all of the details, but what it'll tell you is that when you have any one major plus two minor, or any two major plus two, uh, sorry, any one major plus two minor, or multiple minor, you start to define a complex bifurcation region, right? We'll skip over this just in the interest of time, but this is to show you that the complex and simple bifurcations were fairly well separated using these criteria, where complex bifurcations did worse regardless of how you treated them. But what this didn't answer was, what effect is the stent type? What effect is the role of intravascular imaging? And is there a role of the technique that we use, right? Should we use one stent, two stent? Should we use DK crush? Should we use coulotte? Should we use provincial, uh, um, provisional and then a bailout? Should we use an upfront two stent? So let's talk first, we won't talk about stent type because that's beyond the scope of this talk, but let's talk about the presence of IBIS or lack of IBIS. These were the ESC guidelines in 2018 that classify the use of intervascular imaging to assess severity as a two-way recommendation because what we recognized is that under-expansion of stents clearly indicated a higher risk of MACE at one year, so not a particularly long-term follow-up. But now when we look at more recent studies, specifically the ultimate study, that came out by the same group as did definition in DK Crush 5, Shaolin Chen and his group. What they did was ultimately define the role of this tool in these types of lesions, where they did a one-to-one -one randomization of IBIS-guided versus angiography-guided PCI. And what they did was initially one-year follow-up, and then thereafter three-year follow-up. And what they found was, you know, there was a discussion about, is this really making a difference? Even at one year, there's a difference in MACE rates of 5.4% with angiography 
down to 2.9% versus uh, using IVA. So almost a 50% reduction, almost a 40% reduction. And then when you go out to three years, that reduction persists. What's more is as you get from optimal PCI to suboptimal PCI, so optimal PCI being defined in this study is larger than 80% of the distal minimal lumen area, you actually get similar differences where when you're actually doing a good job of sizing your stent and making sure your stent is well expanded, you're getting huge 40-50% differences in your ultimate primary endpoints, which in these cases is target lesion failure that is ischemia driven. Right? So these are hard outcomes, these are real, these are patients showing up on your tables. This is not statistics. So let's look at DK Crush 5 then when we start talking about technique. Right? This is the most recent study in the series of DK Crush trials that has looked at whether or not you should use DK Crush in particular as a way of treating left main bifurcation lesions when they're simple or complex. Right? Um, these were Medina 111 or Medina 011 lesions, and they got randomized to provisional with bailout 2 stent versus upfront DK Crush stenting. And then there was one year follow up and then eventually three year follow up. And what they found interestingly was. DK crush was superior to provisional side branch stenting for distal left main PCI, whether you were a complex or a simple bifurcation. This is now controversial, right? Because the belief is that if you can provisionally stent and maintain good side branch patency with good flow, that's a better choice. There's less metal. Interestingly, when done by a group of really good operators who know what they're doing around this technique, this shows superior outcomes using the definition criteria to define complexity. And then when you look at these outcomes longer term, they're still pretty impressive, where there are significant differences in TLF, target vessel MI, and target vessel rebalance. There was no difference in cardiac death, but these were grossly underpowered to detect that. Anyway. So what this told us was that at distal left main bifurcations, we should be using the DK cross approach, which is an upfront two stent strategy. Right? Should we, which, what, how, how do we suss this out? Well, here's a good, well conducted trial. But the thing is, it depends on who you are, what operator you are, what your patient looks like, and how you practice. So in this picture, I see a duck. Does anybody see anything else? There's a rabbit there, too, right? Here's the face of the rabbit. And these are the ears of the rabbit, as opposed to the bill of a duck. So this is where EBC main comes in, right? Which is a, another very well constructed trial out of Europe with a different group of operators who see slightly different left main disease on average, and who typically use an upfront one stent approach with a bailout two stent, typically using Coulomb as opposed to DK crush. So these are the sort of fundamental differences between EBC main and uh, DK crush bottom. This was a step-by-step -step layer technique. So if you went to a two-stand approach from a one, this was not a failure. This was simply the end of the normal procedure, right? Which is, you needed a second stand, so you put it in. It was a, will one stand be good enough approach? So this is now a trial of provisional stenting versus two stand up front. And that's different than DK crush, which is DK crush versus nothing. Okay, I'll go through these details fairly quickly just because I hear the alarm in the back of it. What we notice about this trial is that the mean syntax was 22 versus 30 in the DK crush trials. There was 29% diabetics and the age was about 70 years. What they found was that there was no real difference between provisional and DK crush, right? So provisional was good enough to use. And that's why when they looked at the primary endpoint, they found that death and my TLR was no difference between your systematic stepwise and your systematic your step systematic stepwise dual versus your systematic provisional stenting strategy. But when you compare DK crush versus EBC main, you see fundamental differences in these groups, which is that the age was younger in DK crush 5 versus EBC main. 
the side branch lesion length was 16 millimeters in DK Crush 5 versus 7 in EBC. So fundamentally, if you've got a 16 millimeter lesion in your side branch, you're probably not going to leave that anyway. That's a real lesion that needs treatment. Your crossover rate was significantly higher in DK Crush 5. There were more patients that crossed over to 2 cent. And there was an upfront 2 cent strategy then that was used uh, in the in the DK crush arm that used two stents versus the provisional arm, which obviously you can't do with the DK crush technique. So what this taught us was that the lesions that they were treating in DK crush 5 were probably worse, right? There was probably more severe disease. And that is why that group of patients may have done better with an upfront two stent approach, as opposed to EBC main, where the severity of lesion complexity was lower. And so it may actually be that Thank you. It may actually be the lesion complexity is really what defines the severity of who's going to do well and who's not going to do well with a two-stent approach. So, to summarize then, what we did in this one,